Hello, June. How are you, love? All right. See you after. Hey. Yeah. All right. Michael Philip Jagger, leader of the Rolling Stones for 10 years. He's on his way to another Australian concert. He's feeling the strain of performing in extreme heat in open air venues. Ladies and gentlemen, the Rolling Stones. But the tour is going well. The Stones have been living up to their reputation as the world's number one rock group. The only disappointments have been for the press. No hotel sieges, no mass hysteria, and no major scandals. On the Australian tour, the music was to be more important than the headlines. The next day saw the first of the two press conferences scheduled for Australia. Most of the Stones touring party, or STP as their identification badges read, were there to meet the media. Leslie Perrin, public relations man for the Stones and known by them as Lunchtime. His other clients include John and Yoko, Frank Sinatra, the British Legal Association and almost the Cray Twins. He arrived ten days before the group to coordinate press relations. Peter Rudge, the Rolling Stones manager, the tour commander, the ringmaster. He has complete authority which usually goes unquestioned. He looks and acts like a Cambridge Rugby Union coach. The roles are probably not dissimilar. How long do you gentlemen feel that you will be? Five four minutes. minutes. Yeah, it'd be only be three okay. four we, we discuss this. Yeah, five minutes. Hello. 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 Second on the left, Nicky Hopkins, pianist, one of the three extra musicians who now perform regularly with the Stones. Next to him, Keith Richard, guitarist and songwriter, maybe the creative genius within the group. Deadly nightshade, he won't live to 70. What are we going to do? We're going to do uh, one at a time? Yeah. One at a time, right? Channel 7 In the foreground, Bill Wyman, bass man, is planning an album of his own this year, Perhaps he'll be the first to leave the Stones. On the far right, Leroy Leonard, Mick's personal bodyguard. He's always on stage and gathers the clothes and jewels that Mick discards. Mick Taylor, guitarist, ex-John Mayle. He is into the music more than the performance. Jagger treats him gently, for he seems rather fragile. Charlie Watts, drummer. Audiences seem to identify strongly with him. On the surface, he seems the most approachable, yet he's easily bored. At press conferences, he relates more to his glass of blue nun. So we've got we've got your records or some something happening in the background. As a matter of fact, this is great. Oh, we talk to you, Keith. This, you know, with respect, you look a bit like the regular Hesperus with the kind of gear you wear. But is that an effeminate gear that you've got on? You know, I mean, it's uh, it's easy to be offensive. Right? All I was asking was why don't you dress offensive. as you do. Well, and don't be offensive. No, I'm not. I'm not okay. intending to be. I'm trying to find no, out why you dress well. as well. Well, yeah, well yeah. I'm sorry that I, it appears to be offensive. You know. It's all right. We just we just dressed up a bit for you today. That's all. Mm -hmm. Why do you make yourself so accessible to the press? This is something that a lot of us strange were expecting. This sort of really big gap between the stones and the press. Well, when I don't know what they base that because we were always very 
accessible to the press last time we were here. The truth is in Australia that with there's so many press here that you really have to sort of might as well do them. Though some of them are rude, really rude, and like you spend a lot of time with them and like they're really nice to you and then they turn out to be total hypocrites because all they want to do is write an article putting you down. So you feel, what's, why, you know, why do I bother? I mean, it's only two days out of the whole to cut. It was common knowledge that the Rolling Stones were staying at Sydney's Kingsgate Hotel, but there were no screaming fans breaking down doors as there were in 1965. The Stone security guards had only one problem to deal with, a middle-aged American tourist couple who tried to force themselves on Jagger causing members of the Stones' entourage to get stuck in the lift. Lillian Roxon, rock journalist working out of New York, in Australia covering the Stones' tour. Oh, well, um, I think this is very tame here. I mean, the American tour was full of people crying and hysterical groupies and lots of mick, 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 mick. All that, this is very tame here, very quiet. Australians get more excited about Slade and Cat Stevens. I don't understand it. You know, is it because the stones haven't been exposed enough here lately? I, I haven't worked it out. I mean, I've been staying at the hotel three floors below him, and I didn't see groupies running down in the elevator lift trying to get him. I didn't see kids crowding the lobbies. Oh, been I, nothing like like that. I mean, I like girls, you know, I mean, I would, you know, I mean, I've been, uh, what can I say? I like in some places you get the girls uh, in hotels and some places the security is so good you don't. Uh, I mean, in the American tour, you know, you get a lot of girls. You could always call the security off. Uh, yeah, but, you know, I don't really care, you know. But, I mean, whatever happens, happens, you know. I just take it all as it comes, you know. When we go to Japan, it's going to be a really, like, teeny bopper scene. In Hawaii, it's really, really young, you know. It's gone far 12 beyond to, that. 12 to 12 year olds in Hawaii. L last week, it was it, two weeks ago. Uh, it's different in each country, you know. Peter Rudge, the tour manager. What does he think of the absence of Australian kids trying to break the security? In America, we didn't have anything. We didn't have any kids rushing in or out. Um, I mean, is it straight? I mean, did Slade have a lot of kids rushing in there? They, they seem to have created more hysteria than the Stones have done. You know, they seem so sort of well organised and so mellow with the whole thing. Really. Yeah, well, that's that's what we've tried to. You know, <clears throat> that's exactly what we've tried to do. If three or four kids run across the tarmac when the Rolling Stones arrive. It sometimes does get interpreted as uh, wild hysterical scenes in the newspapers the next day. And uh, Mr. Mr. Jagger's problem and the Rolling Stones' problem is that they are a bit famous and well-known. And, uh, you know, if Fred Hubbard and the Blues Boys arrived in Australia and they were mobbed by 300 kids, it would probably get two lines. But if uh, Mick Jagger was embraced by a 60-year-old grandmother when he got to Melbourne Airport, <laughs> it might possibly be interpreted as a riot. The Rolling Stones tour rocks in the Melbourne this weekend. And to mark this great rock event, 3XY are giving away giant full-color Rolling Stones tour posters and car stickers. They're available free from Walsh's Jeans Dungeon, corner of Swarston and Burke Street City. It's just another Free Stones goodie from your official Rolling Stones station. Hello, this is Mick Jagger, the Rolling Stones. Melbourne's Tullamarine Airport is deserted, although one Melbourne newspaper has released flight details of the Rolling Stones' arrival. The 26-member entourage who had flown into Australia with 10 tons of equipment has collected an extra 16 people, mainly security guards, in Sydney. The only crowds are here to greet is Beatitude Maximus V, Malkite Patriarch of Antioch and the Orient, in Melbourne for the Eucharistic Congress. Did you go out to the airport at all when the Stones arrived? No. <laughs> Why not? Don't you think they're worth that? No, I listen to their music. That's all you're interested in? Mm. So, do you think <laughs> a lot of people then aren't prepared to sort of go do that thing like going to the airport, trying to get autographs, no going to the hotel, go. hiding in lifts? Yeah, they no did, one they did. They did. Like they did. They I think we're growing out of that myself. I think, I think, yeah. I think you know, like that was back in the Beatles days, you know? They don't do people don't do it anymore. They come to hear their music more. <laughs> if he wasn't a rock musician, he would still be, you know, the celebrity he is now, without a question, without any doubt at all. And therefore, the pressures from that anger are immense on this tour. And, and it's one of my big moans all the time is that this isn't a rock and roll tour. It almost becomes impossible to run it like a rock and roll tour. You can't just walk on any plane. You can't just shamble into any hotel and hang around the lobby. You can't just walk down the street because, I mean, when he goes to a concert, you know, 
it's on the front page of the paper, which is fine. But I mean, I, I, there's very other few, you know, where the Beatles maybe, that would, would, would get that type of spread on a major newspaper just because he rolled up quite unannounced at a, at a, at a concert, you know, two hours after he got to Melbourne. There was some comment in Rolling Stone in the article following the American tour. The music was almost a byproduct. In fact, that was said by Peter Rudge, that it was sort of between gigs, you know, which is the exciting time of being with the Stones. No, I, I saw for me, it's booked. Uh, uh, I mean, for me, the exciting part is playing, and you know, the rest of it's just hanging out and just living in hotels, and uh, which is really dull. Or, and you try and make it interesting, you know, you get. You play, you think of everything to do, you can go out. And usually when you go out, it's a drag because like, you get very selective about what you want to do. I mean, I don't like going out to just sort of, you always go, then you always end up in the wrong place, you know? <laughs> like you were saying that last night. Uh, whatever, you know, you just end up in the wrong place, the wrong girl, you know? Uh, and you wish, oh, I think I should stay at home and play records. It's better, you know. <laughs> this is home in Melbourne, interchangeable with any other luxury hotel. It's where, at 3 a.m., Anna Menzies types up the daily information sheet for the entourage, what's arranged for each day and what vitamin pills to take. Entertainment is usually confined to the two floors that the touring party occupies, and there's not much use made of the cars, ready to take them anywhere at any hour. Those who spend most of their time out of the hotel are the tour heavyweights, the technicians and sound men. It's a matter of adjusting the basic stage, sound and lighting equipment to the local venue. The production manager for both the American and Australian tours is Patrick Stansfield. I look at the venues and I uh, meet the managers, meet the electrical contractors and the local personnel, the key people, give measurements um, and there's a, a, just a million details that people want clarified, you see. Then I come back with the crew <clears throat> and, uh, well, we supervise the setup. Um, most places we aren't as fortunate uh, as we are in Australia uh, to have a permanent crew that travels with us. We have one promoter here. Normally we have a different promoter every two or three shows. You know, have changed incredibly over the years. How have your attitudes changed then into your songwriting? You just write about what you see and what you feel, and that's what I do, you know, so... You know, I mean, most of Amer American lyric writers over the last five years, all they've done is write about peace in Vietnam, you know? So I wonder what they're going to write about now, you know? I mean, uh, I just... You know, I mean, I, I, the traditional sort of rock and roll song or pop song is like just about women, you know, or love, or but I mean that's pretty. I mean that's a pretty good tradition, you know. So what are you feeling, sort of, in a radical way or a sexual way? You know, um, you've never really got into a lot of political stuff. The Stones never had, and there was fairly, you know, sexually based songs. Yeah, well, I've always felt more sexual than political, you know. I could never get that worked up about Edward Heath, you know. I mean, so, it's, you know, just whatever reaches you first, you know. So, I guess I'm kind of short-sighted. Mostly it's between me and Mick, uh, but you usually find that a song is usually written, like, 80, 90% by one person, you know. And uh, we usually help, you know, I mean, Mick comes to me and say, look, I got this. And, uh, and I say, well, I've got one like that, you know. So we sort of stick them both together and see if they work out, you know. And, uh, but usually a song is written 
over 50% by one person, you know, and then the other, somebody, you know, I don't know, I'll help Mick or Mick will add a bit to one of mine, you know, and we'll get it together like that. It's very different when you're playing on your own, being a, st in, in a home, you know, and sort of humming to yourself and playing with, like, five people because all the riffs that you play become different and they get turned around, the beat changes, you suddenly discover that this works and this doesn't work and you make this up, you put this together. Oh, you know, and then you come out with what you've written, which may or may not work, or you may, it may be too slow and you sort of double the time. I was right, all my songs are always too, too slow. I mean, they always work out to be going twice the speed in the end when they're recorded and what I've written. That's right, I mean, I've gotten used to it. Yeah, I mean, Andrew Oldham got Mick and I into writing songs because I was, you know, I never thought I'd do anything more than playing a guitar. And Mick never ever thought any more than singing, you know. And it was Oldham that said, come on, you've got to get it together and start writing, you know. Is it you then who draws the sort of Robert Johnson inspiration? You know, that he, you know, he obviously wasn't going to last very long, he burned himself out. Is that how you feel about writing about yourself? No, I mean, uh, I don't feel that particularly about it. I'm too sturdy. But um, I felt that about Brian. I mean, everybody did and everybody knew that. Even Brian felt it, you know, that he wasn't going to be around that long, you know. And, uh, although it was a shock when it actually happened, nobody was really that surprised, too. You know? There are people, I mean, I'm sure that everybody's got those feelings about certain people. Everybody knows people that mm. you just have that feeling about they're not going to be, they're not going to be 70 years old ever, you know. They're, not everybody makes it, you know. It's one more day of the Australian tour, and at Monsovac, the second and last press conference in Australia. Despite the security guards posted all around the property, no one even attempted to break the security. The castle was built by 1930s Melbourne Bohemians, who'd be pretty bored at today's press conference come party. The commercial television stations try to put some life into it. There is a story going around that you... Uh, uh, someone tried to smuggle some pot into the country, is that... Uh, Who did? Well, what kind of... Yeah. Pot? I don't understand. Shame which pot was it? I don't understand the question. It's not true. I don't understand the question. I thought the question was quite plain enough. Uh, someone was trying to... know. I don't understand, understand the question. Sure. No, sure. no, I'm very sorry, sir. There was nobody trying to smuggle pot into the country. Phone up to anybody you want. Mr. Bradley, our about. immigration minister the other day... Ask him. Uh, Ask him. Phone him up. And offended you very strongly. And huh. Uh, came out very much in your favour. What do you think of him? Well, he was saying, for instance, one important thing that he wanted to put across was that Australia wanted to be part of Southeast Asia, which is very... Uh, what's the word? Admirable. Admirable, I thought, you know, uh, after years of isolation. I mean, I hope... It, it, the only way I can see that happening is if more Southeast Asians come here. Because yeah. it's very difficult to be part of Southeast Asia when you don't understand that mentality. But um, uh, he was very nice. Never said in that story. It never said. So, you know, if you start on that, you know, I, that's why I was so rude to you, because you started on that. Because if you want to follow up in TV journalism what rubbish they dish out in the press, then you're pretty low. Just take me from the back there, do So watch out, boy. The Australian press certainly tried to find the sensational headlines. In Auckland, Mick's hotel bed sheets auctioned for $400. Two ounces of grass-like substance found in the charter plane carrying the stone's equipment to Brisbane. But there was no direct link with the stones and the issue was dropped. Back on page one in Adelaide, 40 fans arrested as a crowd of 4,000 tried to storm one of the concerts, but no really big news. And in Sydney, some last desperate headlines before the Stones departed forged tickets at the Sydney concerts. Individually, and then, or you can do it collectively if you wish to begin with. Les Perrin is the man who tried to keep things in perspective with the press. He's been seven years with the Stones. He's followed the change in the public's attitude towards them. We did notice two years ago that people listen a lot more than the music than they waste their energies on um, extrovert exercises of their, their own benefit. 
um, they like the music and they listen to the music, they get involved in the music. And again, reverting to Auckland, uh, all these thousands standing with their hands above their heads, clapping in time with the music. Some of them singing along as the lyrics of things like Jumping Jack Flash and so on. It was something quite unique and I don't think there's any decline in the um, excitement, it's just um, channeled in a different direction. No, I come from music. Do you think that whole hysteria thing is dying down now? No, not really. Because they haven't been out here no, for ages. Have you ever been to a rock concert where that whole hysteria thing has happened in Australia? Uh, yes. What's, what group would it have been? Oh, Joe Cocker. I've been a Rolling Stones fan for years, and uh, they're really good. They've slackened off slightly. I like their older music, but uh, I still really like them. What about going to the hotel? Would you prepare to sort of find out where they're staying and, you know, try and see them at the hotel at all? No, not really. It'd be too much bother. You don't think it's worth it then? I oh, probably is if you knew how to get there and everything, but I can be bothered. What would you I'm be looking for if you went there anyway? Mick Jagger. <laughs> oh, you go and see Mickey Jagger, don't you? You like Mickey Jagger, you go and see him. I think that most people came for the music, and that's what, that's what most that's what I came for, and for all the kids that are out. You can see that there are millions of kids. Yeah, we're not out to over, to take over the country or uh, the world or anything else, man. We're just rock and roll musicians, and that's all we are. Oh, yeah, I think the mafia are that easier job to get in here than, than we would. Bit <laughs> off the production line. God blind. Okay. <laughs> How are you doing? Oh, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Yeah. What are we when, doing? when did you get back to, to Britain, Rick? Uh, last week. Before we get on to the album, let's talk about the film. But anyway, she didn't turn up, so I had to do it. And um, so... Did you <laughs> 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 you notice that during the film, I, that I infer in between numbers change jackets and trousers very quickly. This is because yeah. I'm very good at changing jackets and trousers very quickly. You did film it over a period of, what, three days, was it? Maybe? Yeah, actually. Yeah. Which accounts for the trouser changing. <laughs> what made you choose the abattoir to do the gig? Well, it's really the only place in Paris that was unfashionable. Because the trouble with the French is, though, <laughs> the trouble with the French, if I may take my glasses off at this point. The meat market is <laughs> the only place you can get off in the, the Paris. The account executive look. The trouble with the French is that they try and make everything into an occasion. Oh, which is laudable. Simple. It's got to take two written down already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But they turn up in, in an evening dress and diamonds, you see. Even when we did the Palais de Sport, which is like the equivalent of the Wembley, uh, what's it called, pool? Or, or Leeds University. Could be. Anyway, so the, the abattoir was so sufficiently disgusting that we thought we could um, obviate that. But even then we had to make a special section for people dressed in evening dress and diamonds. <laughs> It's but a bit like the Cow Palace or something in San Francisco, where there's lots of mud mm -hmm. and things on the I floor. See, yeah. Wait, well, when it's dried out, it becomes dust, mm -hmm. which, when the house lights are turned up, mm -hmm. provides fantastic atmosphere. Well, this is bound to be cut. <laughs> I had this speech ready. Because you've been fairly kind of reticent about doing television filming before. Except for you? you, of course. That's true, yeah. I mean, is that the reason that you decided to take the best of three days, so that you could pick off the very cream of the performance you put on there? Well, no, we, uh, we, I mean, actually, the guy that did it, we were called uh, affectionately Freddie the Frog, who directed it. <laughs> well, Freddie Heiser. Olympian Heiser. French, is he? <laughs> <laughs> He's not French, I don't think, actually. It was no fun editing three nights in his front no, room. No, he was of, very good. We, his old we, lady was ill as well. <laughs> they have to tell him that. But okay, sorry, we, No, we managed to, uh, you know, have some say in it, so we could... Um, pick out what we thought musically were the, the best played numbers and he could say which, which were the best numbers visually for him and we had to make some sort of compromise or come together on that. Were you pleased with the overall result when it was finished? Yeah, I think it sort of basically holds up. It's quite difficult to make a rock show hold up. When I first saw it, I thought it was horrendous. Uh, but, <laughs> um, I mean, uh, because you know you, you you know you know you've done the numbers much better before and all that and and it was very difficult you know playing in front of all those uh, lovely French people or oh, frogs as we affectionately call them. Mind you, uh, Michael does know a few phrases in <laughs> French, which does help. That's right. <laughs>
So putting them all together. And, uh, and then, of course, some of the tracks had to go. And then we also wanted to do Skew's Eye, something different, a bit from this usual um, high everybody, you know, 100,000 seat stadium. So that's why we did the... the that's how there is no side three. <laughs> no, side three is all the Alma combo, which is pulled from just two nights that we did in Toronto at mm. that 300-seater club. Wow. That we're all standing, actually, but uh, it's... Really? That's my favourite side. How right. about you, um, Joel? Well... Do you prefer the energy mm. from a... Uh, the atmosphere, the energy from a smaller place in yeah. that way? Yeah. Still. Yeah. Why do he doesn't? I don't know. I, no, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't ma matter, you see, it depends where... It, depends it, what you're doing. It depends what the energy, the energy can be... It, the energy can be very low in 100,000 people there, in actual fact. Mm. I mean, amazingly enough. Um, you can't dance on a little stage. I no, I can't. Well, I'm limited. Exactly. That's why it's not so much fun for you as it is for us. Yeah, one of the things that impresses me about the live album too so much is the sound, right, and how good it is. I mean, can you explain to us what goes into recording a live gig of that kind? Well, you set it up. Did I? I believe so. Well, you set up uh, sort of about 32, 40 channels out off the stage. <laughs> the best. <laughs> <laughs> and out of that, you have to get about 20. It's a bit like what we're doing now. Um, you know, and you go into a, into that into the mixer. I mean, it's uh, and you just you don't do any EQ, uh, you don't do any ch sound changes at all. You just get everything down you can, because people are always tripping over mics and uh, and making noises and all that, which is why sabotage. Yeah, other right. acts. Yeah, other people wander on the stage, or you get guest artists trying to play piano, or you get you know <laughs> you know that sort of thing. Guitarists out of tune. Uh, <laughs> drummers missing beats. Before we joined, this is yeah, never for our right. time. No, but you know, you just re you set up a whole bunch of mics. The only is thing is, I don't think you should record it like that at all. But I mean, you can't get any recording engineers to record it how you want because they record it all so close and they never take any notice of the sound in the hall. You see. How do you think it should be recorded? Mate? I think it should be recorded oh, just like at a, there's a certain point where it must sound really the best. You know, Which uh, is a cross between the mics on stage and those placed out in the audience. Yeah, about mm. sort of 20 rows back or something. And, and you, then you need not have to mix it so much as you do. But they don't ever do that properly mm. for some reason. Yeah. They don't use themselves, and so probably because they want to mix it all afterwards. It's so clean. So, so how mixed is that album? Well, it's very mixed. <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> got to be because it, it's, all, it's all mixed. Um, I mean, obviously, you get an audience track in it, you I mean? But I mean, I don't think I think you should just be able to record it and not hardly have to mix it at all. Mm. Mm. But I mean, uh, that's not how they record live albums these days, or ever did. You know, it's yeah. a hell of a difference between uh, side three and side four, say. You know, because side three was down in that small club, mm. and side four you're back into the open arena, so where it's big. housing thousands of people. You know. Yeah. The other it wasn't for the bombs that went up. There's a lot of bombs going off on, the, on this album. Yeah? Yeah. When you've heard it, Mick, you'll oh, uh, <laughs> realise this. Because <laughs> there's another film that's uh, d d sort of on the edge of, of surfacing at the moment, and that's the Ladies and Gentlemen film. Yeah. Which was made, what, Charlie, 73 was that? Yeah. Me. Yes, yeah, it's you. Don't know when it was made. I've only seen it once. It's a good sound. It is good sound. What actually is that film? It's a film of the, the American tour? Yeah. That's it what it is, it's just a film of the It was actually meant to be a, a movie, you know. But we, what happened? I don't know, Frank. Don't ask me. We couldn't get it's it. It's supposed to be playing, it. it might be we're, playing we're, we're, the we're rainbow. A, we had a great idea to make a movie, but yeah. we're using the colour, which is the live bit. I'm totally against it, unless they overdub me. He's not on it. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it just came out as a straight on stage thing. I mean, it's, it's a drag, really. What are you going to do with that film? I mean, what's happening to it right now? I well, we're going to. Hopefully, it's going to be played at the Rainbow um, soon. One night. I don't know if it is or not. We're trying, we're trying to find a copy of it. <laughs>
Ah! <laughs> Excuse me. That'll be the telephone. Oh, too, isn't it? Yes, I want to know now. <laughs> Oh, tell me, it'll here, be about Charlie. 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> What's your mum? She said, Charlie. when are you coming home for dinner? I'll be home. <laughs> I'll be home very soon. All right. Let's, let's just finally look into the future as far as the band's concerned now. What are your own plans oh, over the next me. three, four months? Hey? What are your own plans now when we cover the next three or four months? We're going to make oh, this, like, this go uh, studio, studio album. album. Right. Yeah. And then, uh, then we're going to go on the road. Again. Again. Yeah, because none of us have got any houses. <laughs> we're going to go to the studio. We've got nowhere else to live. <laughs> then we're going to go on the road again. We're going to go to the studio. Another suitcase. And another. Oh, no. <laughs> How solid are plans for that? Very. Oh, uh, pretty solid. No, they're not. Of course they are. <laughs> solid. <laughs> like a combination lock on my suitcase. I've got it all worked out. Don't worry. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I've <laughs> <laughs> got a wee nose. <laughs> See you next week. Yeah. Bye. Charlie, want to take up drinking again? No. <laughs> yeah! Hello. Thank you. Hello. 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 Okay, we'd like to uh, do our first number, which is, no, uh, it's a very good turnout, we're very impressed. Uh, more th someone told me there's more people here than for the Pope, but uh, I don't know if that's your disinterest in religion or whatever. But. No, it's Polish. <laughs> we're, um, well, anyway, we're very pleased to be back in Australia after such a very long uh, hiatus. The Rolling Stones, as you know, haven't been here since whenever they were here. 1973, I think that was, and uh, we're pleased to be back and bring the whole... Voodoo Lounge, Shebang, the whole stage, and I think some of it left uh, for Melbourne in January from Belgium, but um, it's quite a long time to get here. <laughs> and uh, um, what else was I going to say? Not much, really. Um, so, is that it? And uh, We will, um, that we are, we're honestly available to take a few questions, which we'd uh, glad to try and answer for you. I know Ronnie is up for anything. I'm well, dying to. It's been 21 years for me. 22 for you, I think. That's right. So, first question, the man in the hat over there. No, no offence in, intended, but you blokes, you are not, not oil paintings. I just wondered, how come you pull such... Nor are you, I don't think. <laughs> ah, yeah, you... I haven't said my swine. question, but... Check it not out. even a watercolour. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I don't know. Let's see. How do you do it, it's Charlie? It's a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> we don't mind a bit of mercy killing either. Is someone yeah, actually, yeah. I'd, I hate to do all this bit myself. Is someone doing the question, who's in line? Yeah. Oh, there you go. Okay. Eight months into the tour, um, are you still enjoying it as, as much as day one that was in Washington uh, in August last year? I think more. <laughs> day, day one's always a nightmare to me. I mean, <laughs> I hate day worked. one. Uh, when I get oh, day one over, I'm really happy. Uh, uh, it's much... You know, it's, it's, I tell you what, it's really great to be in a place where you, you just arrived in a new country like we've just got here, and so it's very exciting. And, um, you know, it's always a, it renews the whole thing when you get to the next new country. Welcome to Australia. Nice to we, see we you. We met didn't we? In Tokyo, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, tonight you're having dinner with uh, the Premier of Victoria. Just a drink, Jeff just a drink. Kennett. Yeah. <laughs> Who I might point out is not the most popular man in the state. Um, they, they never I are. Was just wanting to know, just wanting to know, when you go into one of these meetings, what kind of politics do you talk? Well, they, people don't. They're, they're very rarely talk politics. I mean, it's just a sort of, you know, there's not only him there. There was a big crowd of. Uh, so I did have a quick glance at the guest list. There's a lot of uh, well-known people from the state and out of state, and there's actors and whatever, musicians and so on. So it's not just politicians. So, well, you know, we get round to meet, we get to meet people. It's kind of nice to drink with the natives, I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, hi there. A lot of people say um, they don't like going to outdoor concerts as much as indoor because they lose the intimacy. Mm -hmm. What have you done to sort of um, fight that here? 
Well, it's certainly <laughs> looking out on it. It's not intimate. Intimate, it's not. I mean, it's a really big. It's a big show. It's a big event. Obviously, it's very different from playing indoors or in a club or in an arena. It's totally a different ball game. So, you know, it's it's the, the it's a musical thing, but it's also an event, and it. So that's what you know what you're getting before you go. But, you know, if you want to go to an intimate concert, you go to something else. I think. Uh, it's a question for Keith. Um, Neil Reid from Sunday News in Auckland. Um, I was wondering if you had any plans to go to Ed McCargill on, on the tour. Sorry, I didn't get a word of that. I was wondering if you... <laughs> no, come here. Is there someone that can translate this one? I, I was looking I think it's something to do with New movie, Zealand. Uh, I was wondering if you're planning on going to Invercargill. Invercargill? Oh, man, yeah. Uh, a place that once that was enough, man. <laughs> I've no doubt it's changed. at everything associated with the tour, do you think you're as much a marketeer as the musician that, uh, that you're famous for being? No, I think, I think the, the thing of being the, the, the musician and the you know, singer is the most important thing and the marketeering you leave to other people. So your question for Keith, you always said if anyone left the stones it would be in a coffin, I know, but with Bill going, do you think perhaps he has done you a bit of a favour? Well, I'm, 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 I'm bending that way, you know, and anyway, I couldn't afford the coffin. <laughs> Gentlemen, um, welcome to Australia, over here. Um, what is it about the Stones that keeps it going, you know? I mean, it's, it's been... It's right here. <laughs> but can you, can you sort of give us an insight into to what's within the inner sanctum of the Stones, in, you know, in, in your minds or whatever? I don't think it was, you know, people now you think, oh, it's all sort of smooth and wonderful. I mean, we, we've been through a lot of ups and downs in our career. I think all careers go through ups and downs and they either sink you or you learn from it and you get stronger and so on. I think there were certain points when we, when we were looking, you know, down the bottom a bit and, you know, you get stronger from that. And uh, we've had a lot of... The other thing is we've been very lucky at the beginning and, and we work, we also work hard at it. So all those combinations, you know, it makes you, you think, when you're down, you think, I'm going to really work at this and make it better and come back. You know, we, we, we've had a few comebacks and, and all that. So I think that makes you strong and we, keep, we just keep at it. Mick, the uh, term the greatest rock and roll band in the world. It's a load uh, of old bullshit. <laughs> Did you ever feel comfortable with it? And, no, no uh, I always disliked it. It wasn't something that, I mean, it's just one of those awful things that was laid on us and... Still trying. You know, it makes you feel like, oh, please. And who do you think should inherit the trophy? I've no, well, you tell me. <laughs> what trophy? <laughs> yes, there isn't yet a trophy. <laughs> even. No trophy. There's nothing to win. Uh, guys, open question to the band. You were there, you pioneered this sort of uh, stage setup, and you were there in the early days when it was really simple. How has the technology affected the way you perform? And do you ever wish that it was sometimes simpler and you were just guitar amp and the audience was right there in front of you? Well, yeah, I mean, I must say one of them, I mean, we've had some great gigs on this tour, but one of the most enjoyable for me was the very first one we played in the club in Toronto, to be perfectly honest. So I, I think they are great, but that's not what we're, the, we're doing on this tour. So you have to p perform differently. You, you, know, you make much bigger gestures and so on. And then also y your choice of numbers, I, I always think, is slightly limited in insofar as that you, you really want to play perhaps more of the more well-known numbers than you might if you were playing in a smaller place. No one uh, condemns you anymore. Have you at long last gained respectability and do you miss the controversy of your earlier days? Well, yeah. We learn how to we avoid did. it. We've had... <laughs> we, you know, it's funny because you do go to places... When we are in South America, we had a lot of opposition from the Catholic Church. So it's, it, it is sort of still lingers. But in civilised places like Australia, of course, that's all gone away. Excuse me, uh, Mick, James Young from Herald Sun and 3RRR. Last time the Stones were uh, in Melbourne, you're doing sets are about a little bit over one hour, only 14 or 15 songs. Now your sets are almost twice as long. Are you fitter now than you were 22 years ago? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> While I've got the mic, I have to ask this question of uh, Keith. There's so many rock and roll myths. When you were a little schoolboy, were you uh, hand-picked because of your angelic voice to sing in a choir at the Westminster Abbey for the coronation of our Queen, Queen Elizabeth yeah. II? Yes. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> Piece of great information. Isn't it? Quit. You didn't know that. No, I didn't oh, know that. that. Old bit, old. Mick, hi. The costume was amazing, <laughs> Mick. <laughs> Are there any pictures of this? Mick, no. can I ask you? 
Hello. You're interrupting our conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Mick, in the 60s, did you, you ever imagine, imagine, did you ever think that you'd be doing concerts in 1995? No. In the quick... <laughs> No, you thought we, you know, just take lives as it comes. Well, I thought it might, we might do it. And in those days, people went and came and went. A couple of years, you had a good time, and then you went back to the day job. But it, it, things obviously changed. You know. Keith, Keith uh, who do you listen to these days? Are you, what other artists are you listening to? And do you still actually listen to Chuck Berry? Well, he once once hooked, forever cooked. You know. I, <laughs> and yeah, who else? Now and again, I do. Uh, uh, Go on, Ronnie, who do you listen to? Yes. Why? Ronnie has Why? A we, listen, we still listen to Chuck Berry, yeah. And Keith, Along who are you listening to? A bit of Mozart. A bit the, of odd, the odd bit of Mozart. I listen to everything. And I mean, if there's some new stuff out that it, that it gets to me, I listen to it. But, uh, you know, I'm broadening the horizons. Charlie Watts is helping me. He's getting me into jazz. <laughs> Mick, it's Francis from Triple J. Look, I'm just wondering, uh, word was that you'd actually done some work for Michael Hesseltine, the trade... Uh, Minister for uh, John Major's government. Is, is that true? And uh, have you been uh, promoting well, British trade this, overseas? This uh, party is t tonight, I think, oh, I think we're going to tonight, is partly hosted by the British consul. And that is part of the British government, which is part of the government of the day, which is the Prime Minister, which is John Major. So, yes, in that very loose way. <laughs> We are involved with it. You know, there's a de facto government. You can't really be involved with it if it's not, so to speak. Just, they come and they go. Just a, a question to anyone in the band, Ross Hampton from the ABC. No one seems to want to be churlish enough to ask it, but they are, promoting, they are they promoting this as your last time in Australia. Who is? The promoters. Just got it. Oh, yeah. uh, well, I, <laughs> I thought it was the first time we were behind. When, when, when does it all end? We don't we, know. We, we, we have to ask Paul Dainty. We're... Mm. We're looking at, you know, uh, people offering us shows for 1996 at the moment. We haven't actually um, booked them, but we are looking at whatever we're being asked to and looking through them. So I suppose you could say that, and that isn't this tour, this is another tour as far as I'm concerned. That's a, a new tour because this tour ends in Europe as, as far as we're concerned because that's the end of it. And then, but 1996 is another yeah, it's another tour, so we're looking at that. So the answer is... Who knows? We're booking on to the next year. G'day, fellas. I'm just wondering what... Uh, up the back here, Charlie, what would you like to say about this tour? What's it been for you? <laughs> <laughs> what? what, what? <laughs> How would you describe the tour that you've had so far? <laughs> Bloody hard work. <laughs> What's been the toughest part? Hey? Up the hardest bit. Getting up <laughs> in the morning, you know. Yes. Actually, <laughs> Charlie, could you take that one step further? Is it possible for you to explain the differences between Daryl and Bill in terms of bass playing, uh, how that's ooh. affected this band mm. and the tour? Different colour. Rather. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's a different colour for a start. <laughs> uh, no, I can't explain. Hey? <laughs> You're pri very privileged to get an extra A out of Charlie. Um, hello, I have a question for Ronnie. Ronnie, will you be snapping any Polaroids for the internet down here in Australia? Uh, oh, you saw them, did you? I do, I see them every week. What was yeah, them every this time week. from the stage. What was that? Have you seen Snapping. your pornographic po Polaroids on the internet? Yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. Of his pictures. No, she's talking about the Polaroids I snipped, uh, snaps or whatever it's called. You don't see or something. Come over uh, later. Uh, what, Polaroid, internet. Polaroids yeah. of what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's a question that goes back in time a bit. Is there? <laughs> you never got <laughs> to I've that got one, Charlie yeah. to answer for later on. <laughs> Is there any plans to officially release the uh, Ro Rolling Stones rock and roll uh, circus film from 1968? I think there is, actually. We're still editing excellent, it. Excellent, excellent. Right over to you. I think it's, it's out in America. I think it's coming out very soon. Okay, thank so you very much. Reach here. Uh, further to the technology, 
sorry, over here. Further to the technology, how hard has it been to make sure, g'day, how hard has it been to make sure the band hasn't been swamped by the show? It's very, di very difficult, but it, we've managed it. Listen to the it's music. It's tricky, you know, I think that, that, that um, on this show we decided to, to, to integrate the um, screen, instead of sticking the screens at either side and just sort of saying, well, you can watch this, we put the screen in the middle, in, behind us, really, which I, was, I thought was a bit of a dangerous, possible dangerous move, because you wouldn't actually look at the band, you'd just look at the screen, but in what, how it's turned out and how they've been shooting it and so on, it's become sort of integral to the show. And uh, so in that way, I think that, well, of course, you've got to perform well on it, and you've got to you know, outperform the gizmos, so to speak, and not let them overwhelm you. So it was a very fine line, which you've always got to be worried about, and I think hopefully you'll see whenever uh, tomorrow that we that hopefully we've done that oh and contrary to the our man from daddy cool the day of the ant has gone you, you'll be able to see us much better with this uh, massive screen that well, you completely <laughs> lost me on that one Ronnie. well you obviously haven't been reading the papers Hi. Oh, i've, I've read paper enough papers again? but a quite small a few. print yeah, right. gentlemen uh, Dennis from Danger Lowbrow. Two quick questions. Any chance of any club shows here in Melbourne? And secondly, I think on behalf of a lot of, a lot of people here, thank you sincerely for 32 years of great rock and roll. Well, that's... Thank you. What a very, very generous man. And um, I think that we're unfortunately not going to be in Melbourne long enough to do any club because we do the two shows and we're off to the other town in Australia. Um, and... <laughs> Hillary Pink but is... they're always fun to do, and I, uh, and, but I don't think we'll have time. Hi. I think, can this be the last question? Is it all right? Or, Hillary or is there is lots more? TV3 News and Lots more. And all right. We'll go a bit longer then, all right. Hi, TV3 News in New Zealand here. It's been a long time since you've toured our country too. Does As you know, Keith's dying to go back to Invercargill. <laughs> does, it, does it hold any special appeal for you? Sorry, I admit, sorry. Does New Zealand hold any special appeal for you? Well, when I, when I personally was last there, I remember being, um, you know, having a really good show, but suddenly a gin bottle hit me right on the head. That's one of my great memories, Ouch. and I sort of carried off. Um, but, yeah, no, New Zealand, we have, from, going back to the very first uh, show we did there with Roy Orbison, um, uh, which was really a, a good memory, because we really did the whole of New Zealand. That was before it was fully <laughs> colonised, I think. <laughs> Including several sheep. That, uh, I have a particular affection for uh, one or two. <laughs> yes, we have a special affection for that, some of them. And um, I, I think there it was... There well is in the back there. And I know it's... <laughs> it's um, the audience brought their pets. But we have a very fond memories of it, and uh, that, that tour. And um, we're looking forward to going there this time, too. Donna DeMeo, 3AW. Hi. Um, during your stay in Australia, besides performing, what do you hope to do? I mean, how do you have fun or relax while you're on tour? See what you've done with it while we've been away. <laughs> you got it's grown. <laughs> no, 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 just work, so work, work, work. It's quite a lot of work, this touring. It's unfortunately, you know, people come and say, oh, well, you must do this and you must do that and you must go to this. And, and to be honest, you... you you don't. You're working, <laughs> and you can't do all those yeah. things, and you say, well, maybe when I come back as a tourist, I'll do some of them. Excuse Hi. me. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, you go first. Oh, thanks, darling. Hi, my name's Jessica. I'm from Triple M in Sydney, and you all look just fabulous. Now, Mick, you especially. <laughs> now, I've, now, I've got to say oh, that girl. I was reading heaps about you before you went on your we tour, and you run a lot, and you exercise, and... You eat great food and all that sort of thing. Do you have some really special people um, in the entourage, like, um, you know, masseuses, acupuncturists, Thousands. anything, you know, oh, colonic yeah, irrigation, yeah, you know, yeah. anything? People that cook kangaroos' oh, tails for you. Yeah, um, all that. Come on, tell me. Like, uh, you know, what's no, it? <laughs> okay, Trevor, it goes like this. <laughs> uh, not really, no, none of that. It sounds great, isn't it? but not really, no. We don't have uh, a lot of over-pampering on that area. Excuse me, uh, Mick. Some it's people, from some Crystal people, Palace. <laughs> Sorry, Ron. Some people might say that the band was actually at its best in '73, and yet you're only you're playing to audiences ten times the size in Melbourne. Now, is that a phenomena of '90s rock or of the Stones? Do you think? I think 
It's uh, totally wrong. Eh? The Overeating, band, are they? The band is probably better now. And, uh, um, Keith, did you see that there's an excellent new John Lee Hooker album out, and he's 75. Yeah, there you can, go. Can we uh, hope to see uh, you recording uh, albums into your... Well, that uh, gives me 14 years. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Angie Nelson from Triple M, and I just want to know, how do you amuse yourself before you actually go on stage? How do you keep yourself amused? And the other thing is, uh, I hear you... Great joke book. <laughs> no, Mick, I understand you're actually a, a bit of a computer games freak, and it's not uncommon to see you backstage playing computer games. Mm. Uh, it's really... Not, I think it's really for the, the uh, unemployed, the video games. <laughs> um, the... We were too busy doing our stuff to play. Oh, Keith and Ronnie play a game of pool before they go on. I think that's how they do it. I um, speak for them. Soundly thrashed every and, time. Um, before we go on, no, it's all concentration and studied professionalism. Now, I'm doing the nostalgic piece of 1973, and I'm, from what I've read, Keith doesn't remember much at all of that tour. Is that true? Well, there are the odd gaps. <laughs> Um, I've interviewed a few government ministers from that time. Yeah, and they in my hotel room, yeah. <laughs> they said there were a lot of negotiations they went were behind... in the toilet. <laughs> they said there was a lot of negotiations went behind the scenes to get you out here. Mick, do you remember... Well, I know this that? has been the subject of some television piece recently. And, um, oh, regurgitation. And they, they, yes, it's real regurgitation, because they dug up the immigration minister. I, I heard, I didn't see it. <laughs> they dug him out, and uh, yeah, apparently it was quite difficult to get the visa. But that was the, you know, it was all over the same, all over the world. I mean, America was the same thing. It was endlessly problematic to tour because they thought that we yeah, were like. Well, was on a par. Well, no. Everybody else is. But you know, yeah. Do you remember at the time promising you'd be good boys, and that Mr. Whitlam even stepped in at the time, our prime minister back then? Yeah, I, I do remember that, and uh, yeah, that was what had to be done then, and uh, even this time, I think that that. Uh, Mr. Kennett had to try and break some of the red tape so we could play here on the day when they were going to have the cricket match, which, of course, they didn't get in the final anyway, so it didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, last question. Excuse me, guys. Just down here with the video camera. Where are you? Over here. Oh. Oh. Uh, Ken Francis speaking. Uh, <laughs> just wondering, having not been in Australia for 22 years, is there anything that you plan to add to the Voodoo Lounge show to make up for that time that you spent away from Australia? Ooh, well, well, you know, I mean, yeah. local Australian songs. <laughs> yeah. Hey, what keys Watts and Matilda are in? <laughs> we have sound checks for that purpose. Well, anyway, guys, gentlemen, <laughs> ladies, and uh, we thank you very much. It's been a lot of fun, and uh, thank you very, very much for coming. We hope some of you might yeah. come again tomorrow to, be to see the, the show. And uh, good afternoon and good evening. Thank you. Behind these doors are television camera crews from all over the world, NBC, ABC, CBC, even the BBC. One floor up, we've got Belgian television, two floors down for all I know, it could be Lithuanian cable television. But they're all here to interview the Rolling Stones, who are in town to pick up a special Grammy Award for their lifetime's achievement. They're also here to promote a new album being made for a new record company. And the questions they'll be trying to answer will be the ones they've been faced with for the best part of 25 years. I've done about eight. Well, so I understand, because you've got there early. No, on time, 49. One takes you to Japan, the other one has to take you to Germany. You know, one takes you upstairs to America. Yeah. Ready now, yeah. mate? Yeah. <laughs> She's not actually working. A question. What about the future? I mean, are, are the stones firstly, are you going to stay together, do you think? Yeah, I think so. At least, I, you know, first off, I hope so. Yeah, and uh, like I said, I'm going to find another load of mates now, you know. Where am I going to find a drummer like Charlie Watts? So who was that? You just talk Japanese. In English. Presumably. In English. Uh, they've all been in English, apart from the French. You, you, you do French or French? Yeah, the French were funny. Cause what is it now? 232, second floor. Who is it? American. So what, what was that one? <laughs> no, hurry up, Ron's dying for a slash. Um, it's oh, all right, you can say that. Yeah. What was no, that? Well, uh, good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good yeah. morning, America. Yeah. And where are you going to now? Uh, I don't know. It's uh, good night, Taiwan. Eh? You can probably take a bit of choice, actually. I think we've got Holland down here or France. Oh, great. This must be America. <laughs> <laughs>
And what, and what motivates you to go out and get on the boards again? Bill. I mean, Bill. Besides Bill. Just keeping Just to see if I motivated. can still dance out there and yeah. still the sweat and get the crowd going, you know. I can't imagine Bill Wyman dancing. What a horrific thought. What do you mean? Every tour, man. Eh? Really? He dances all over the stage. Oh, that's Mick. Oh, that's Mick, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. The... No, Mick's the bass player. What? I thought he was he the one that... He just stands there. He's your favourite undertaker, don't you remember? Bill and Ronnie have done Australia. <laughs> and if we give them Keith or... This is terrible. That's awful. <laughs> and if I give them, they do Keith or Mick. Yeah. And Molly will be happy. Okay, we must get the Italians covered because they've had absolutely nobody. Do you actually enjoy this, doing it production line style like this? Do you say the same things to everybody? No, no. Uh, we've been doing this for 20 years. We, uh, we even dream up 15 different answers to the same questions. But you do get asked the same questions? Oh, yeah. What's the most popular question? Uh, are you going on the road? <laughs> yeah. All right, Bill, can you get up there? Can you get up a little bit higher there? I'm the benefits. I'm the Grammy. Apparently, Segovia's coming on to play. We've got five minutes, okay, now. Yeah. Bill, come in a little bit. That's it, that's it. That's the one, that's the one. Oh, yeah. Super. Okay, Charlie, let's see a bit of the scarf, please. Yeah, a bit of the jacket scarf. underneath. Yeah, What's underneath the coat? You're doing great. Can you? All right, go on, keep that. Sorry about the pattern, Jackie. Oh, you can keep up the pattern, mate. All right, try. Can you do one more? Can you just get into it? Yeah. That's it, fine. Yeah. Come across a little bit more. No, just got, we're going to put another four of them. That's it, that's it. Good, mate. Mike was in. That's fine. Super. Yeah, it's Mark Engels. That's a name I've never heard. Thanks very much. Close up, work. Close up, work. Yeah, right. So, what songs are we playing tonight on the Grammys? Um, where's the booze? Roll over, mate. Ladies and gentlemen, can I get your attention, please? When we come out of this commercial break, Surely. there's going to be a film montage of the Rolling Stones. Near the time. And then the presentation is going to be made. During the presentation, could we have quiet, please? Over the years, the Recording Academy has had the honor of presenting its Lifetime Achievement Award to people such as Frank Sinatra, Ella Fitzgerald, Duke Ellington, Elvis Presley, and last year's recipient, Leonard Bernstein. It is my privilege to present the first of these to a group whose impact upon contemporary music has been felt over nearly a quarter of a century and shows no sign of diminishing so far. They are, in fact, the Rolling Stones. When it goes like, you'll go dead quiet. Yeah, yeah, completely quiet. He won't say anything. Yeah, right, won't say anything. Sorry, Mick. Will you give it to him? We'll go all humble and calm. Totally humble. Suddenly, Suddenly, Mr. Humility. From the Roof Garden Club in central London, would you please welcome a legendary guitarist and rock performer, Mr. Eric Clapton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here tonight to provide an example of the cruelty of Mick and Keith's sense of humour. You see, they know how useless I am at this sort of thing. Nevertheless, I'm very proud to be chosen to give this award to them because they're very dear friends of mine and as far as I'm concerned, they are what rock and roll is all about. Toughness and relentless to the very end. Anyway, let me read the sentiment here from the trustees. It says, this trustees award is presented to the Rolling Stones, the most volatile and intact rock group to survive the 60s. And a band that has grown and changed musically and lyrically with society's dynamics. Influenced by some of America's earliest and greatest rhythm and blues artists, Mick Jagger, Keith Richard, Bill Wyman, Charlie Watts, Brian Jones and Ron Wood introduced this music first to their native England and then to the rest of the world, pouring the foundation for modern pop and rock performers and writers to build their careers. Don't try and play it. we got three. <laughs> um, I'd like to say uh, thank you very much, Eric, for the no. award, and I'd like to say thank you to all the people that have stuck by this band through thick and thin. Especially me and Brian. And, <laughs> and to all the people that took the piss, the joke's on you. Thank you very much.
Congratulations to the Rolling Stones. We're all excited about it here too, guys. Now, you said that, that um, to you, the Rolling Stones are what rock and roll is all about. What does that mean? Well, the other night, there was a memorial tribute to Ian Stewart in the 100 Club. And I haven't seen the Stones play live in a club for 15 years, I don't know. And when Keith kicked it off, it took me back to what it's all about. Really, it's just power. And making it right you know, on the stage. I don't know how you can do that unless your soul is in it. I think they found that out too the other night. They really do feel good together. They are a fantastic band. Do you think they're natural video artists? Well, they've been filmed so many times. Um, I talked to Mick at lunchtime about some other videos they've done, and I think a lot of the videos that he's done have gone back into obscurity. I mean, they've done so many, yeah. uh, and all of them have been different. You know, it's taken a long time to go from there yeah, to yeah, there. Yeah, I mean, yeah, otherwise yeah. you're running, and I don't yeah. think that really. I agree. Right. I agree. So you more or less found it. You might see a turn and go up. Yes. I mean, we pick and take up, and you come back down. Yeah. yeah. We try. We try to get away from the normal gloss that a lot of videos and probably a lot of mine tend to go towards and then give this one like a rawness and a hard edge quality and a bit of a violent sort of nearly a bad quality is this an expensive video as they go no i mean big is not necessarily expensive it's not a very detailed set it's a de it's a set that actually is done with broad strokes and actually that is quite it is quite a reasonably economic video this one so you're hoping to get it all done today yeah it's all about you know 3 a.m i'd like to run the whole song yeah yeah, we're only using very small bits of this, but it'd be good just to run the whole thing through and see what happens, you know. Yeah. When I first came to Barbados uh, seven years ago, this is where we were, Jerry and I ended up. Um, in this house for a holiday, it was kind of, this is the quiet, you know, this is the quiet side of the island. There's not many tourists here. Without being rude, this doesn't look like the top end of the market. It's the shishi end of the damn market. I say, <laughs> what sort of money are we talking about for a... For a, a I would think they gave it to us. Oh, really? But they wouldn't be charging much anyway. I don't think so. Do you have a reputation for not throwing your money around? Well, I mean, I'm not, I don't like to give gold sovereigns to dormants, but, I mean, I, I think you should be generous with people that haven't got it. You don't have to be generous with people that want to rip you off. But you're a bit careful. You, do you argue with shop assistants? And things like no. That? Well, that's a horrible habit. Hello, what have you got? Cornet, rum, rum raisin. I have a pineapple cornet, please. How many more? Is you guys? No. Any more for any more? Pineapple cornet. Eric, you've got vanilla cup. What else is going Everything Mick gave him, Charlie Watts put into this ice cream, like in ice cream parlor. Good night, guys. <laughs> Apart from the obvious thing of being the singer and the chap up front, yeah. what role do you perform with the Rolling Stones? Um, well, I got lots of roles, uh, <laughs> apart from being a singer. No, I'm a writer. I started off doing um, lyric, lyric writing very early on, and then I moved on to writing melodies as well as lyrics. Yeah. I mean, do you um, write on your own nowadays, and Keith writes on his own? Um, yeah, well, we've always done that actually, until the, uh, uh, apart from the very early ones, um, a bit of both. And um, then it's all kind of the organisation thing that I start to do. Um, after, really, after Andrew Oldham, I suppose. We had Alan Klein, but he wasn't really a, a person that was on the spot all the time. And yeah. I started doing organising and things like that. 1969, we started opening our first office and stuff like that. Do you enjoy that? Um, no, a lot of it I find tedious. I mean, how are decisions made for the Rolling Stones? Well, the idea is shoved up and it's, it's either taken or it isn't, you know, on a more or less democratic basis. I mean, people, obviously, it's like anything else. People are 
have to be sometimes convinced to do things and sometimes not. Yeah, yeah. So, um, let's talk for a moment about your, um, you made a solo record, yeah. She's the Boss, which yeah. was a... How do, you, how do you assess that in retrospect? Are you pleased with the success it had or do you wish it had been more successful? Well, everyone wants their stuff to be more successful. I mean, it, it did on the par with the Rolling Stones' last three records. It sold about the same, so, yeah. on that level. But I mean, that's not really the reason I did it, to make a huge uh, record, make millions and millions of dollars. I mean, I wanted to have a bit of a laugh outside the band so that I wouldn't be always putting ideas to committee. Because yeah. that's what a band is, it's a committee. And you know, you probably, Everyone knows what that's like, yeah. and and it is a committee. You know, it, people, democracy is a very difficult way to run music. And it takes, and that's why records and all that take a lot of time, and that's why you have inevitable disagreements. People want to do one thing, other person wants to do another. So whether it, so that inevitably people are arguing in bands because people want to do different things, especially when you've done the initial thing that you set out to do which is to be successful. a successful yeah. band. So then, then you've done that, right? And you've been doing it very, very successfully. And so what, so what, what, so what else do you want to say? So, so it's, it's, in a way, it's kind of interesting. It's fun to go in a studio and just have your own ideas and let them uh, flow in any way you want. Yeah. Yeah. Rather than always going to the committee and saying, please, would you do this or do like that? Which is another way of making records. It's a very good way because you, both ways are, are valid in my mind. Because you, one way it's your stuff and musicians bouncing, bouncing off like in a band. The other way it, it's very much one person's idea. How do you, this new record, how do you rate it in the, in the range of Rolling Stones records? God knows how many there have been. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I couldn't rate them. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a rater. I mean, it's a very good album, I think. I'm not sure how it compares with, say, Aftermath. It's a very, very different album to that one. Vegas Banquet or Satanic Majesties. Or, I mean, they're all very, very different. How do you feel about Satanic Majesties? Love it. Which Love is the it. one that everybody always says is an embarrassment. Lovely records. What's your favourite track? Um, Gomper? Two, 2,000 Light Years From Home. Honestly. <laughs> you don't look back on that as, appalling, as an appalling mistake. No. There should be a few more mistakes like that, I think. Yeah. Do you think it would be better if you were kind of you were able to make mistakes yeah those. i think it'd be, it'd be about much nicer to to be a bit more i, I mean I, if i got criticism of the rolling stones that that is and myself because i think it applies to me as much as any um that is that they're a little bit cautious you know and yeah but i mean that rock music is rather cautious even the most experimental people are, are cautious What does Mick yeah. Jagger do? He sings. Who is? Yeah, yeah. get out. Go on, Rolling go on. Stones. The Rolling Stones. I was in a band in South London um, called the Cliftons. We were playing black R&B music at the time, uh, like uh, Little Richard, Fats Domino, Coasters, Lloyd Price, that kind of music, which is. It wasn't rock and roll, it was more R&B at that time because rock and roll thought of in England was Cliff Richard, Marty Wilde, all those kind of people. Um, and then you had all the terrible show busy people who were making records like Dickie Valentine and you know, you name them, David Whitfield and Alma Cogan and <laughs> Lita Rosa. <laughs> uh, multitudes of um, And we were trying to do something a bit more soulful down in South London. It wasn't going down too well because they always kept asking us for foot tapper by the shadows and you know, and all that kind of thing and uh, Cliff's latest records. Uh, but there, were, there was an interest in American stuff, stuff like Jerry Lee Lewis and that, in England, Elvis, of course. We did sort of merge into that. And uh, my drummer answered an ad he saw in a paper, because it kind of fell through after about a year and a half. We weren't getting anywhere. We were doing all right, but uh, nothing amazing, no amazing gigs. And um, he answered an ad for an R&B group, and he came up and he met Keith, Mick, Brian, and uh, Ian Stewart, who'd had bits of a band together for six months, five months actually, um, with odd people sort of filling in. Charlie had filled in on odd occasions. He was playing with Alexis Corner, and um, 
Mick Avery had played one gig, I think, who, who later joined the Kinks and, and so on like that. And, and Dick Taylor, of course, who formed the Pretty Things later. And he came back and he said, they haven't got a bass player and it's quite slow blues music and it's quite easy to play and interesting. So when you go up, so we come trundle up in the snow with all my equipment. I had a, a Vox AC30, which was gold dust in those days for somebody who wasn't in a professional band, you know. I had a small um, reverb and, uh, and a small amp and I had this huge wardrobe that I built for bass with an 18 inch speaker in it and uh, it had concrete in the bottom and it was like a great big wardrobe and it took four people to carry it, it was so heavy. Uh, because someone told me if you put concrete in the bottom you get real good bass sounds, you know, so I did that. And, um, and I built this, I sent away and built a little amp, one of the, a 25 watt amplifier, you know, from sort of radio and retailer or something, one, yeah, yeah. one of those weekly magazines. And we fixed all that up and I used to get electric shocks off that. Every time you plugged <laughs> into it, you know, put the plug in, you used to get shocks and I was pretty many of foot and blew up in the end. So where did this audition take place? Weatherby Arms. It's a pub it used to be up here on the, in World's End, just up the bend there. In Chelsea? Yeah, because they lived in Edith Grove, which is the next road up, which goes across. It's the road down from the airport where all the traffic go. Um, <coughs> three of them, terrible flat, you know, really this is Mick disgusting Keith. flat. Yeah, Mick, Keith and Brian, with another sort of uh, ne'er-do-well person called Felge. But somebody who subsequently turned up as half of Nanka Felge, or they borrowed yeah, his they name. They just used the name, yeah. As that as group, group re um, uh, writing. And although people said at the time Nanka and Felge was Mick and Keith, and it wasn't, it was the band, oh, writing as a band. So Nanka was that face they used to pull like the Quasimodo sort of, or the reporters. What sort of people were they at that time? What do you think of them? They just bummed fags off you all the time and money and that, you know, they didn't have anything. So you became a receptacle for, for passing sort of food and belongings to them. You had a job, didn't you? Yeah, well, I had a family. I had responsibilities at home and um, Charlie was working. Ian Stewart was working. I'd give him lunch and vouchers from ICI, where he used to work. He used to cycle up there to save money from Cheam, and um, Mick was at London School of Economics, he had a grant, so he used to split that. And all you ever did there was just keep giving them fags, buying them beers, buying them fish and chips, meat pies, and just keep going and keep giving them shillings to put in the gas meter to keep the flat warm, because it was one of the coldest winters, 1962, going into 63, was really a bad winter, and they were on starvation level, they used to lay in bed all the time, because they didn't think, didn't see any reason for getting out of bed, because there was nothing to do. And they'd get cold, so they thought they might as well stay in bed. <laughs> it was, they were sort of semi-mad at that time, I think. So what was your estimate of how long this group would last at the time you joined them? There was something about the band that I liked, you know, something quite raw and... I mean, it was just totally unique. To me, what it, we're living in South London, I thought of them as what we and Hancock and people like that, comedians at that time, thought of as beatniks. I didn't know what a beatnik was, I'd never met one, so when I met them, I really thought they were what was called beatniks, because they, they had long hair, they had scruffy clothes, long jumpers, you know, they just looked totally wrong, you know, and, uh, in a, but in a fascinating kind of way, and I wanted to be part of it. When I used to arrive in my teddy boy drainpipe trousers, they always used to take the piss and... <laughs> So anyway, you started making records and uh, had a certain amount of success. I see you've got, a, you've got an old poster on the wall over there for uh, one of the early package tours. What was that like? That got mad in a physical way with fans and, and all that. But before that, the, the, like the year and a half or two years of clubs and small ballrooms was um, unbelievable because we'd just turn up in this van just all climb out of this van, all carry the gear in, which was an assortment of odds and sods, you know, bodged up stuff, when everybody else had all the same amps and all the same colour guitars, the same uniforms, makeup, the hair done all the same, you know, and they'd all do walking and... We used to bring out these three rusty stools out of the van and used to set them up on stage around me. We used to stand on the mic, me, Brian and Keith would sit on the stools with a beer. We'd have a sort of amp next to you so you could put your beer on and your fag. And uh, we used to smoke and drink beer, no uniforms long hair and Charlie would be over there and that's where we'd do it, we'd play a song and we'd stop and we'd have a beer and we'd have a chat and then we'd play another song, it was like rehearsal time and ignoring the audience and they, 
they must have found it fascinating too. It was quite extraordinary when everybody else was doing all that other kind of stuff. So there was a, a real fascination there for people looking at us, as there was when I first met them. You know. Looking back over the 25 years, what were the high points and what were the low points? Low points is when all the drug busts were going on, I suppose. He didn't know whether who was going to be in jail what week and who was going to be in the studio. It was like that. And um, when we all went to France because we couldn't afford to live in England anymore. We'd, we'd been a number one band for eight years and suddenly we had no money. We didn't own anything that was supposed to belong to us and uh, we owed the tax man a lot of money which we thought was paid so we had to leave. And then we were accused of being like tax exiles, money, but, you know, reaping the benefits. It's the only thing we could do. Otherwise pack up, you know, and become a taxi driver or something. That was a bit of a downer because we didn't really want, I didn't really want to live in France but I had no alternative. So what about the high points? My magic moments are more like the end of a tour. When you all have a big hug and say, thanks mate, thanks for playing great guitar and Charlie, thank you man for those, for those offbeats and that's the nice times, you know. Just about there. Yeah. What about your fringe? you want that down? Do you want yeah. that down? Yeah. Yeah. Russell. A problem. I have a problem. Problem? Yeah. You have problems? I've got to stick this boot on. Oh, yeah. put some of the airspray on the boot. <laughs> <laughs> What's the book? I don't need something. Yeah, I didn't get any of that. I don't need that. Do we just take it on? It's a spray case, so it's not most. Just kill it out. No, I didn't know I wasn't spraying the first place. Here, look, here, yeah, this side. <laughs> no, I have another problem. Uh, Last all. Um, what are you sure think? Jane? This uh, rubber bit's coming off my boot and I can't grip on that ramp. Okay. Or Super glue get my, boot! Get my, get my sneakers. The first time I went on stage with them was June the 1st, my birthday, 75. And I had to learn about 150 numbers in, in a couple of months. You know. Was that tough? Yeah, it was... Who taught you them? Did you just sit there with Keith and be taught them? Yeah, because although I was aware of the songs from the records, I'd never actually sit down and played the chords, you know. Everyone thinks the Stones are about three chord merchants, and they nearly are. But the other ones that they throw in are pretty tricky. You know? So it's still a matter of just two interlocking guitars in the Rolling Stones? Yeah. That's something that Keith and I have always luckily had from the start. We never plan um, as such exactly what we are going to do individually. We have a knack of if one goes this way, the other one will slide in this way. Yes. It's like if a solo comes up on a certain number, we don't even look at each other. If I want to take the solo, I'll take it, right? And if he wants to take it, he'll take it. Really? You leave yeah. it as, um, as loose as that? Oh, yeah. Are there it's... ever any nights when neither of you take it? Yeah, that's when he's knocked me out, or I've knocked him out, physically. <laughs> now, if he, uh, he would certainly tell me if he didn't. Well, if you know, if he particularly wanted to take the solo and yeah, a yeah, certain song, yeah. I mean, without any messing about, he'd let you know. Yeah. Do, do you ever feel after, after sort of eleven years, I have along with the Rolling Stones, that you've played every guitar part like that that there is to play? Yeah, uh, Chuck Berry. Uh, when I saw him last year, he said to me, hey, "No one is doing anything that Mozart ain't already done." <laughs> yeah, that's true. A Rolling Stones record, but everybody has to put in their max at the end. It's just a matter of when with the people that arrived in Paris and, and Mick wasn't there for a few nights and so they sort of say, uh, oh yeah, Keith's there pulling the shots, you know, they're only sort of grossly exaggerated, you know, it's just winding the band up, you know. The impression given though is that you're the man that winds the band up. You're yeah, well, I guess I, in that going. respect, I guess I am, but I, that, that's, I always am, you know, um, for that because, you know, with the guitars and the, and the drums, and, I mean, I, I have to play and I have to get them to play, you know, for so that Mick has something decent to sing to, you know, really. I mean, so, I mean, I am the winder-upper in that respect, yeah. The impression given is that they're, they're four chaps who've got hobbies and so forth and other obvious parts of their life, whereas you're the bloke who lives for the Rolling Stones. Um, yeah, I guess. Uh, it's not that I don't have any other interests. I was after all, I've got a family and, and kids and... Uh, but I, don't, I don't spend my time doing fret work or anything. But um, <laughs> I guess, no, I, I've... I really enjoy playing with the Stones. I've played with loads of other people too, you know. I mean, but um, 
and as, and as good as any of the other people are, but I really enjoy doing the way I think that I can put across whatever it is I do, I can do it best through the stones, you know. Would it be true to say that your life changed after 1977 when you were arrested in Toronto for a possession of heroin? It's very difficult for me to talk about what I was like before the Toronto incident because I, you know, it is all a bit of a haze to me. I mean, if I want to know what I did certain in those years, I have to ask Bill Wyman, you know. <laughs> who keeps the archives. Yeah, and he'll say, oh, you were out of it, man. I, I guess so, you know. How long were you out of it for? Um, typically, say, when I was working, I, I would be straight, you know, and I'd clean up for tours, and uh, I, I've, in retrospect, I guess a real I, problem I had was adrenaline, you know. I mean, I could never come down off of a tour, you know. I mean, my, I'd go home, everybody would disappear, and I'd be, and my body would be saying, Where's the next gig? You know, where's the, and, uh, and it would just keep on going. And you know, I'd know what would happen, and I'd eventually go back to the stuff again just to calm down. You know, and uh, I mean, I've eventually uh, I've grown to deal with that in the last nine years because it's been a long time since. You know, I'm, uh, you know, it's been a long time since I got into that, and I sort of forget about it, you know, unless, I mean, I, I'm well aware that it all went on, but it's, it is, it's very different for me. Um, I guess I've grown up some. What's your relationship like with the other stones nowadays? When you all get together, does it just click straight away? Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, the only family up until recently that I've had for a while, you know, yeah. I mean, they're the constant ones, you know. We've read a great deal about your relationship with Mick uh, recently, that uh, you want to go on tour and Mick doesn't want to go on tour, yeah. and that's the cause of tension. Is that the case? Yeah, but I mean, it's no... I mean, you don't do a gig like this without having fights occasionally. This one just happens to pop out into public, you know. Yeah, I thought the Stones should go on the road this year. But as I say, I'm a selfish guy. I like to... I just what I really like to do. So, I mean, um, I was just sort of pushing my own thing in there, but... Um, at the same time, if somebody doesn't want to do it, you know, you can't f force them, you know, and uh, because you wouldn't be doing the audience a favour or the band, you know, you've, everybody's got to want to do it. Seems to be some rather violent material on this record. I'm thinking particularly of songs like Fight. Yes, yeah, but, um, it's, I mean, there always has been on Stones album. I mean, it, it's, um, I mean, the music lends itself to that we've all, you know, and we've, I mean, from street fighting, man, you know, too much blood, or, you know, that's a, it's a theme that runs through life, and it themes that runs through our music, I suppose, you know. Don't you ever stop and think, isn't this rather distasteful? Well, of course it's distasteful, you know, especially if you're on the receiving end, but, um... I mean, to sing about it. Well, but I mean, what, what do you, I mean, if, if, you, if you sort of stop to singing about things because they're distasteful, you're reduced to sort of uh, singing about embroidery. You don't or, think you, you know, uh, nice Ming China. You don't think you've occasionally been guilty of relishing it rather too much? I don't think, no. I don't think uh, any of you would be accused of relishing the violence. It's, uh, it, we'd be doing ourselves and, 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 every, and the audience a disfavor, you know, uh, we wouldn't be doing them a favor by ignoring it. You know, I mean, I think one of the things the Stones have always done is sort of, laid it out there as kind of as it, as we see it you know let's talk about your other career uh, apart from the rolling stones you run career. the charlie watts big band oh or orchestra same. what do we call it tell us about it what tell us about the charlie watts big band yes, that's what it is and is it, it it's a really large band isn't it, it brings yes, together it's enormous it's called self-indulgence does it cost you a great deal of money to run that it did do to start with it doesn't now are you pleased at the success that's had well, yeah. yeah, it's nice. People want to listen to saxophone players. And... Does it take a great deal of adjusting when you come to play with the Rolling Stones no, after doing something like that? It's the same thing, really. Well, really? Yeah, you have to play the drums, isn't it? As well as you can. How long can you see the Rolling Stones keep them going for? As long as someone wheels you out, I think. I really don't. I mean, I thought, uh, when I joined them, I thought there was another six months. Three years was the longest I'd been with bands. You see. What are you doing between? Goes on and on. What are you doing between making records? Nothing. I understand you, you collect things. Yeah, that's easy though, isn't it? 
you have great enthusiasms outside the Rolling Stones. Oh, yeah. so. Is it possibly true to say that other members of the group don't have those in the same way? That they're more devoted to the group than you are, or is that not true? I don't know. I don't know. What do you mean? I don't follow that. Well, the, the other members of the Rolling Stones, for them, the Rolling Stones are more important than well, the Well, I do have a life outside of them, but I always have had. But I think they've got a life outside. I don't, I don't really look at... The name Rolling Stone doesn't mean anything to me. What do you mean by that? Well, it doesn't mean anything to me. I mean, it's just Keith and Mick, Ronnie and Bill. What would you, be your attitude if uh, there was to be talk of going on tour? Shameless. In the, in the near future. What do you mean, shameless? Uh, my attitude, I don't know. I mean, it's again, you know, if they said we're on the road, I said, I don't know, really. I mean, obviously, uh, you get involved in it, setting it up and all that, but, I mean, it's a lot of work, I know how it is. It's not something you relish? What? Going on tour. I do it doesn't, it's just, it's work, isn't it? I mean, I just don't think about it, actually. That's <laughs> not to. I've been dead years ago, I thought about it. Thanks very it's quite much. quite hard work, some of it. As you've noticed today, I mean, what have we done? Nothing. So sit around. You must have done a great deal of hanging about in 25 years, the Rolling Stone. Hmm. Work five years and 20 years hanging around. <laughs>was asked around about two months ago to fly to London to interview the Rolling Stones. They were over there to promote their new album called Dirty Work. When I got to London, I was told by the PR person there that each uh, interviewer ha only had four minutes. And I thought, well, I haven't flown all the way to London just to get four minutes. So at the big reception that night in a hotel, I sort of connived in my own way, and Ronnie and Bill arrived around about half an hour earlier than they were supposed to, so I pulled them aside and I said, let's go up upstairs and do the interview now. They said, okay, we're doing nothing. So I sat down with Ronnie and Bill, and that was the first part of the interview. Around about half an hour later, I ran into a friend of mine, Tony King, who looks after Mick Jagger. And I said to Tony, is it true that we're only going to get four minutes? He said, no, 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 not true. Don't you worry about it. He said, he said I'll bring Mick around. So... True to his word, around about a quarter of an hour later, he brought Mick in. Mick and I sat down for another 20 minutes and had quite a good chat. He sort of tend to sort of differ with Ronnie and Bill in some, uh, in some subjects, but you'll see that for tonight. Uh, towards the end of the night, I finally ran into Keith, and he was sort of lurching down the corridor, and I said, uh, Keith, how about coming in and, and having a conversation about the album? He said, sure. So in he came, uh, much to the horror of the PR people, and sat down for another 20 minutes. So there it is, the, uh, the topic basically deals with dirty work because that's what we're there for, uh, but they come up with some very interesting answers. Um, I was saying to someone, they said, someone said to me today, what's it like? And I said, well, it's a real Stone Stones album. And I said, well, of course it is, Good. it's a Rolling Stones album, what are you talking about? There's a lot of variety though, isn't there? Yeah. I mean, it sounds more like you would hope yeah, the Stones exactly. album to sound like to me. Um, or up. How hard was it to do the album? I think it was quite hard because um, we spent longer getting into it this time, didn't we? Sort of playing again, because we haven't played for four years. Right. But it was fun getting our chops back together again. It usually it? takes like two, ten days, two weeks to sort of get back into it, and it took right. about a month, didn't it, really, this time? That was the only thing. It just took well, a while for to you to sort of get over the novelty of the clubs and things and finally get down to the studio. It took about a month, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we had, it was good fun, though, wasn't it? Get, yeah. Just getting back together. Is it hard um, when you've all got so diversified interests now uh, to be sort of come under the one banner, being the Rolling Stones, to suddenly it is a time to record, to sort of have to all merge together? Is it's that not banner? hard, because no, it, to me it's the most natural thing for us all to be together as one unit instead of all going on doing different things. So I don't agree with him, yeah, because that's what I was saying before, it took that like twice as long this time, I thought, right. to get back to that sort of ESP that you have, you know, when Keith does something, you naturally go with him and all that, you know, you sort of do it without even thinking, and it takes about a month to get into, it took us a month to get into that sort of situation. Right. Just, oh, I was just already brainwashed. Didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you, you jam with them a lot. Well, I live in, in New, New York, York with him, see, see? Yeah. he kind yeah. of goes around the house and falls around, but I don't, see. Well, I mean, going back to the time when, when you were doing the solo stuff, was it hard then to shake the, the Rolling Stones image? Not really, because I didn't play with other musicians. It was pretty much all what I was doing at home. Right. Just with one guitarist friend, that's all. 
Uh, and I did the whole album like that and we sort of put a drummer on overdubbing, but it wasn't like playing with another band. Is it a conscious thing then that, well, I mean, like, you're going to put down the tracks, you've got to make a decision on what track's going to be used, mm. and people are going to judge it, you know? I mean, is that a hard thing to sort of, or did that not even come into it? You have to, if you don't mind me answering this one, you have to um, set down a whole lot of stuff mm -hmm. to the best quality that you can, you know, like there's a difference of, uh, of kind of styles of music as like Harlem Shuffle is one end, and oh. it's gay, and then you go to the reggae side, and then there's the, you know, out and out Stones stuff, mm. but we had no real plan like it was going to be a certain sort of oh no you just drop you album. just you just do whatever's coming up that night you know right. yeah. you do a track that night and then the next night you do something else and you just keep going and on the and strong on. ones emerge and just leave the keep, others behind yeah because you keep redoing them all the time you know let's have another bash at that one right. and you get a better version of it so the other one's discarded you just keep going like that and after about three months you kind of on and off that is i mean some days two of us aren't there or another mm. day someone's flown mm. back to London because the kids having a There was a lot of covering for each I mean, other on this album. No, but it, it, you know, it was no bad thing. It was just... It, it's it's often the, together, yeah. teething troubles. It's know. often the case these days where you, um, you don't all arrive at the same time in the studio and right. work on the same track. All right, now, with Steve Lillywhite as a producer... Are you back on? Are we back here? Yeah. yeah. How hard is it for him as a producer to control five, well, superstars? I mean, how hard is it? Very difficult, but I think he uh, did it adequately. Yeah. I, mean, I think he did very, very well. He right. played his, his hands It took right. him a couple of days to sort of realise the way to do it, didn't it? Yeah. And he made a few mistakes and was told what to do, and, um, and then he sat back and thought about it and he, and he did a very good job I thought. And there couldn't have been a better bloke for the job. You only do an album every 18 months or two years. Sure. And you only do 10 songs on it and by the time we go in the studio after two years Mick and Keith have got like 20 songs each there is no room for anybody. Mm -hmm. That's to really Bill write. taught me a lot when I first came in like saying uh, you know Woody don't get upset if if you put a lot into a song and you think oh I get a part of it. you know it, it's just time and you you get your just deserves deserves by, yeah d yeah <laughs> walk out now well, you know, shuffle was i mean uh, i mean a cover version virtually sure so it was come on the yeah, first sure. hit yeah, we okay. did two or three cover versions so on this album just, yeah. but we only used one of them it's all over now we did a couple of good but this ones is the, uh, it's the we did it putty yeah and i was just going to say putty the shirelles putty yeah. in your hands great good but time, you can't use two yeah. originals on an album really when you've only got nine ten songs but also we we limber up with, well. with a lot of favorites you and know we hear that we must have played yeah, there's a hundred songs. songs you know we did Jerry Lee Lewis stuff Eddie Cochran we did everything Smokey Robinson stuff right. we did Al Green stuff yep. um, yeah yeah uh, we Great just stuff. like Hank good, Williams good songs and out of those good songs you play someone else's song then you you go into your original song or if you believe in it like, oh, that's a real natural, like Harlem Shuffle was. That was two takes. Right now, I mean, like, you live uh, a, um, a man with, it's almost like Joseph with his coach, you know? You have this coat, that coat, etc., etc. Nonetheless, there's always going to be the Rolling Stones as long as... As long as pop music will exists. continue. Yeah, exactly, you know? Still yeah. known as the Davis Rock and Roll group. Is it hard to go back to a Rolling Stones situation? It's, it's tough, you know, and uh, it requires a lot of patience and work from everyone and stuff. Um, but anyway, the results are there. It takes a while. What happens, I guess, is that it, t it takes a while to break it in. Right. At the beginning and stuff. And people have to sort of leave a little bit of the door and so on. And you, you tend to expect things from people and sometimes they don't, they can't give them what you expect. I mean, I expect a lot from everyone. and. At the beginning, I think everyone, you know, was reticent to give or what. I don't know what it is. It's very complicated. It's a lot of uh, interpersonal relationships and so on, as well as right. music. And, and um, you know people so well that, you know, everything they do, you can sort of tell. Whereas if someone you just hardly know, then then you, you wouldn't take any notice of it. I don't know. Right. 
Okay, I mean, like, like, just the very fact that you have to write songs, um, be it you or Keith or whoever, yeah. you know, um, and to go back into that situation, how hard is that? Because that's really the hardest part. Just... Yeah, it is hard. I mean, it, it, it's all, it's uh, writing them, playing them, are other, are other people going to like me? The thing is, when you do solo projects, you write a song. Right. That people, it's great if they like it, but they don't have to love it, you know, and yeah. they just play it and they do it. Um, you know, when when you're in a band, the band has to like the song. You can write a great song, you spend months on it, or ten minutes, or whatever, but you, you love it, and you go out there and you say, L listen, and they go, it really can be bring you down, I think. Right. And that happens to me, you know. Keith plays me a song, and I say, I'm sorry, I just can't, I don't see it, you know, where is it? And vice versa. That's difficult in a band. Well, just going back quickly over the last year, uh, two major things happened. Oh, three major things happened. The solo album, um, which was a very successful. And were you happy with that? Yeah, I mean, I think for the first one, it was it was great. I mean, the next one's going to be fantastic. If you had said five years ago that Bowie and Jagger would do something, then a lot of the so-called critics would say, no way. So now we've been friends for 10 years or more. More. 15 years. Yeah. <laughs> but sure, there's been the ups and downs. Uh, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. We fights over girls usually. So I asked Billy and uh, and Ron why Harlem Shuffle is the first thing they learned. And what did they say? Oh, I'm not oh. going to tell you what they said. No, I mean I don't, I don't really mind because I, I was we, we kicked it around. I mean I liked other, another couple of different things, but you know when I played the album to people, that is the one track they picked out first and. And putting out singles is not about being particularly clever, about you've got to listen to this six times, because it doesn't work like that. If you've got to listen to it six times, it tends not to be a hit, mm. um, which is the one I liked um, for the first single, and the one Keith liked for the first single. Didn't seem to get the reaction that Harlem Shuffle got, and that got instant reaction from like kids to sort of grown-ups and all that. So we thought, well, go with it, because there'll be other singles, you know. All right, last question is that... Um we had you down in Australia as an actor yeah. with Ned Kelly. Yeah. Um, you've done, I mean, performance uh, and many other roles. Uh, David also acts. Yeah. There's always been this great story running around, and I think I may have even made it up, but no, I didn't. Um, that there was a wonderful idea of perhaps you and Bowie doing a, a wonderful 80s version of something like Some Like It Hot. Yeah. Well, we talked about that, and I think you know we we'd like to do something, and we don't. Um, we're getting towards being that being more concrete. Yeah. And um, we hope this year to be you know working on some story lines for that. It'll, we want to do a comedy, which has music in it. And uh, if we can put it together, uh, films are a very kind of fragile thing. You know, they yeah. can come together and just fall to pieces instantly. But we're both pretty keen on it. We talked a lot about it, so now I said to Dave, you know. Now let's do it, and um, so I think we're going to try and put it together. Though when that will be, you know, it takes. I mean, you think records take yeah. a long while these days. Yeah. Films yeah. take a long time. You know, time you've got the story, scripted it. We have the studio that really wants to do it, mm -hmm. um, and and um, so you know, who knows? That will run maybe if we could get that together by the end of this year, or by shooting it by the end. Of the year. Uh, that'd be quick for films. Even when I started playing it, even when I was like a pimply little kid, uh, what I really liked about good rock and roll was actually the maturity of it, and not, you know, I mean, the, you know, I just felt the adolescent side of it was just because I was 18 or whatever, 17 or 18 when I started playing it, and, you know, there's nothing you can do about your age one way or the other. And uh, all I've found is that the kind that I enjoy playing this thing and and, and the day so when those awful cliches you know but i mean like a lot of cliches there's always an element of truth and um, if you know it's uh the more you find out the less you realize you know and it's it's just fascinating it's in, so intriguing to me and, and especially with the stones now because we're probably in a position to make you know, more than anybody else we're still together and uh, to make the thing grow up you know, right. Because I started, you know, it wasn't just rock and roll, it was blues. I mean, I worked with Muddy Waters six months before he died. Right. You know, guys that, what else are you going to do? You know, fret work or, uh, you know, building model aeroplanes. I mean, it's all I can do. It's what I'm good at. It's what I love.
and and come to that, the rest of them. But since we're talking about me, I'll just say me, you know. <laughs> but I mean, the whole band, as you wouldn't get them off their arse otherwise. Are you satisfied of what has happened with Dirty Work? Very much, yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, I must, you know, I'll emphasize this one for a change, because it's very rare at the end of an album, when an album's released, that you really have a clear idea, or you know whether you're happy with it or not. You don't really know, usually, anymore. And this is one of those rare ones, maybe like Exile or, or Beggar's Bank, and you say, hey, I've done a, you know, I've done my best, I've done a good one. Right. You know, uh, I'll stick my name on this happily, you know. Well, I said it to, um, <clears throat> to Ronnie and to Bill, and then later I said it to Mick. Um, when I heard the album, and then someone said last night, what's it like? I said, it's a Stone Stones album. Yeah, yeah. And I said, well, of course it is, because it's the Rolling Stones album, you know. But I really believe it is a Stones Stones album. It's, uh, I mean, that's the phrase I've been using, like, cause it's, it, while it's been in, in the works and while I've been working on it, it's just like, hey, this, this one, this one's like, uh, it's an like extra, you know, Stones, it's real Stones, and we're not fiddling around trying to, you know, play around with what else, or technology, or anything. We just sort of went in and did it, you know, for, with what we're good at. And we were lucky. Sometimes, you know, we came up with the songs, you know, with, you know, the right kind of songs for the Stones to play and boom, straight through. It was a great, it was a load of fun to make it, a load of hassles too, but, right. you know, what, what isn't, you know. All right, now, reflecting back to the, um, the tour of, um, of Australia, the last tour you did, um, again with rock and roll, you were um, a group and you had the brass players, especially Jimmy, and... You hung around with them because they seemed to be the rock and rollers of of, of the group at that stage, you know. Um, have you always done that? Have you always hung out with the people who are rock and rollers? Yeah, I mean, I don't know, you know, there's very few people that I know one way or another who aren't, you know. I mean, that's maybe the nature of the business and because of what I do, but yeah, I mean, I do tend, you know, you give me Bobby Keys, I'll hang out with him. Right. <laughs> I'll quote even something further. <clears throat> On that tour you had Nicky Hopkins and Nicky said um, there's no greater rock and roller than Keith no matter what he does. Well, I didn't know that. Thank you, Nicky. <laughs> so when it comes down to the album I've got to ask the question. The tour. Yeah, and I've got to say, I can't give a definitive on it, but I hope so, and it looks like it, yeah. I, uh, I mean, if I get my way, it'll, they'll have those bastards on the road. <laughs>